So welcome everybody. Today we're going to be looking at answering common Muslim objections to the gospel. Um, those of you who may have Muslim friends, you know Muslims can be some of the most generous, hospital, hospitable people, loving and caring, but they also like to argue. They really like to argue. And when you try to sometimes talk about faith matters, usually there will be some very strong opinions that your Muslim friends might have. And so we want to talk about those today. Uh, there are some very common ones, and so those are the ones we will be addressing today. Um, but before we start, I actually want to give you my conclusion as the first thing. Before we talk about anything of how to answer Muslim objections, I want to frame it with this one core truth. In the end, before we've even started, in the end, love your Muslim friend. Share what God has done in your life and let your personal love for God and his love for you show through because there is no arguments against these. Most Muslims that I know who have come to faith, and the Atalas probably can also agree, um, don't come to faith because somebody made a strong intellectual case about the validity of Christianity versus Islam. Most Muslims I know, there are probably a few that have, have done that, but the vast majority I know first took the steps of being open to Jesus because they met authentic followers of Jesus who both knew the love of God, declared the love of God, and, and showed the love of God in their own life. And so that's what I want to encourage us before we get into what we're going to talk about, which can, can sometimes move into heated conversations. We need everything we do to be rooted in love for Muslims. Muslims will know when you actually are loving them. They'll know when they're just a project, but they'll also know when they're actually being loved. And that is a powerful testimony. So I want to give you my conclusion at the beginning to frame everything we're going to talk about. The other point I want to make is the pictures that you see up here is various Muslim communities around the world. As you notice, they don't all look the same. They don't all dress the same. They don't all speak the same language. And this is just a mini example of the fact that every Muslim you meet is a human being who is unique and is created in the image of God. And so when you approach a Muslim, I think the most important thing that we can do is learn to ask good questions, to actually learn what a Muslim friend thinks and why they think that. Sometimes the best question you can ask is, why do you think that's true? And just let them work through that. I'm not telling them as much as I'm just asking a question of them. Sometimes also you'll discover as you ask questions that your Muslim friend doesn't actually believe the objections they claim to be believing. Most of the time, they only know these objections because they've heard it from a sheikh or an imam who has told them that the Christian Bible has been corrupted or that this could not be possible or your Christian friends believe this. Your Muslim friend doesn't maybe actually know. They just have heard this and that's what they've been told to believe. So asking questions can reveal that. But today, we're going to get into the three, well, I have five, but we're going to start with three. At the end of our time, uh, we'll see how much time we have left. I'm going to hit the three big objections. And then I have two kind of less common, but still common objections. We can decide when we get there if we want to do a time of question and answer, if you want me to do the other two objections. We'll kind of take a quick poll in the room. But we'll start with the big three. Most conversations you'll have with Muslims will come, their objections will come down to these three topics. Your Bible is corrupted. Jesus is not God. Or you Christians believe in three gods. You're polytheist, something along those lines, but usually questioning the divinity of Jesus. And finally, Jesus did not die for sins. So they're going to question three main things, the Bible, the Trinity, and the atonement. And they're going to say, we can't believe those. And as if they're true, as Muslims, they cannot. That's, that would be against traditional Islamic teachings. 
Um, but we're going to hit these three. And then, as I said, we'll see uh, there's the little dot, dot, dot is because I have two more. I do have those on slides. So even if we don't get to them, you're welcome to take my slides and you can look at them on your own as well. Um, one of the things before we start, you will need a partner because what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to give you the objection and I'm going to give you a little bit of background on it. And then I want you to turn to a partner and you're each going to have one minute to try to say, how would you answer this objection? Okay. So go ahead and find a partner. We're going to start in just a second. Everyone good. All right. So remember what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to read the objection. By the way, oh, some of these are actually direct quotes from with some friends of mine. I sh um, and you're going to have one minute and I'll tell you after one minute, go ahead and switch. So remember, it's a sh I know it's not long enough. In reality, you probably would want to have a lo much longer conversation, but this helps you kind of know where would I go with this objection? Where would I take the conversation. Okay. So I'm going to put the first objection up here and I'm going to say it as my Muslim friends would say it. Objection number one, your Bible has been corrupted. Not a question, more of a statement. You have so many translations and so many authors. We Muslims have one book, the Quran, which has, was given directly to Muhammad by Allah and has not changed for 1400 years. I want to give you a little bit of background, and then you're going to turn to your neighbor, and you're going to say, how would you answer this objection? First of all, one thing you should know, most Muslims have never read the Bible. As much as Ramez is helping out with that, um, many Muslims will see it as a forbidden book or as a book they just don't know how to get access to. Um, I was surprised I had one Saudi friend one time who was actually reading the Bible in Saudi Arabia, but reading it online. He's like, I have no way to getting a physical copy of the Bible. Although because of ministries like the Bible Society, it's becoming a lot easier for people to have it on their phones and, and find it on websites, as well as being able to, to get physical copies. So that is changing, thankfully. But your average Muslim probably wouldn't know that. And so for them, the Bible is just either a forbidden book, a mysterious book, or an inaccessible book. And most Muslims that I've talked to do not bring this objection up because they themselves have done an intensive study and found contradictions. They do it because usually, once again, a sheikh, which is like a Muslim leader, or an imam, which you could think of as kind of a Muslim pastor, has told them the Christian Bible is corrupt. The Jews and the Christians' Bible is corrupt. And I promise you, actually, if you can get past this initial objection, which is very, very important, this question can actually raise some interesting conversations and even open the door to inviting a Muslim friend to read the Bible for themselves. So with this background in mind, I want to invite you to take one minute each. So you have two minutes total. Turn to your neighbor. And how would you answer this objection? If, if you were sitting in a cafe and a Muslim friend asked you this or, or didn't ask, more stated this, how would you answer? So go ahead and turn to your neighbor, first person, you have one minute, and then I'll tell you switch in one minute. Okay, so we'll come back together now. And if anyone feels bold enough, I'd love to hear from like two or three people, what was your answer? How would you answer this objection? Yes, and I'll, I'll repeat if it's not loud enough. I would ask questions. Because uh, I would say, why is it a problem that now many translations and, and all this? I would, I would say, well, you claim the Bible is corrupted, but you haven't made the case. Okay. Uh, so please, uh, I, would, I would shift the burden of proof. Okay. And say, you, you need to do better. Yeah. Kind of, you're making this accusation, you need to provide evidence, which, by the way, is a really good apologetics case in general, when somebody makes a comment about something like, well, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, Christians often feel like we need to make the argument to defend it. But the first thing we should say is, you're the one who made an argument. You need to defend your argument. What's the proof of that? Um, so asking good questions, kind of reflecting back on it. Yeah. One suggestion, I tried to say that with students in Germany. It's probably not very helpful, but I cannot help doing it. 
Because there's, there's one thing that I know for sure that in the New Testament it said Jesus was crucified yeah. and he rose from the dead. And the, and the Quran said it's something else. Yeah. And I would say, you know, I would take 20, 30 years after the event, and then I would say it takes 600 years after the event. Who would you believe? Yeah. I know they're not in a voice master, but I just think it's correct. Yeah. The, the, the response was saying, well, I've got the New Testament that's written within 20 or 30 years versus the Quran, which is coming 600 years after the fact. Where would I believe? I will say Muslims usually get around that by saying, well, Muhammad is a prophet. It doesn't matter what time. If Allah speaks, Allah speaks. But it is, it is an interesting question. Like, why would I suddenly? So one last one. Um, yeah. I would just say when I was a prophet. Okay. So asking another question, when was it corrupted? So I want to try to explain when, then they get into big problems because the Bible was in so many different languages, yep. so fast, and people didn't understand what was going on. Oh, you're stealing all my thunder. <laughs> no, no, this is great. This is awesome. Um, no, because what you guys are doing is a really good thing, which is start with questions. Because a lot of times, if you just make a statement back, it probably won't get you very far. Now, I wanna give you a couple different approaches of how I would do this. And I do need to say, these are conditional on my relationship with the person. I've had people who have said this to me who are very dear friends of mine. My relationship and response to them is going to be very different than the taxi driver in Amman, Jordan, who hears that I'm a Christian and says this. Does that make sense? So I want to give you Kevin's direct response, which if you think about this, this is for the taxi driver. This is for the person who says, oh, your Bible's been corrupted. And that's their way of kind of trying to shut down any actual discussion. Kevin's direct response for this. I will pray that Allah has mercy upon you for what you have just said and doesn't make you burn in hell for that. <laughs> Because you, my Muslim friend, have called Allah a liar. That is a very serious accusation. And you kind of see them back up. You may be saying, Kevin, that doesn't sound very loving. But I think sometimes it is important that Muslims know we take our holy book seriously. One thing, if I can say about answering sometimes Muslim objections is, Christians, we need a little bit more of a backbone. Muslims are very, they will stand confidently on the Quran. Why can't we stand confidently in what we believe as well? Also, I will say that Muslims who have had to have that, you'll see them kind of back up and then they'll think, you're serious about your religion. Good, we can actually talk now. Because I've shown them I'm as serious about my book as you are about yours. A Muslim would talk about the Quran that same way. And I, they need to know I am that serious as well. They need to know that I take my holy book very seriously and I revere it as the word of God and that they need to respect that, not necessarily that they need to accept the book in the same way that a Muslim would expect me to respect their Quran. And sometimes this, this will allow them to, to understand that I do take my religion seriously, but also it reframes the argument. And as I said, this is usually what I use when somebody is just kind of using this as a way to try to control the situation. Oh, I don't have to listen to you. your Bible's been corrupted. Because I want them to know, you may be saying that as a way to try to attack me as a Christian or attack Christianity. But in doing that, you are making a very serious claim about something that is called the word of God. You are making a very serious claim about Allah and what Allah is able to do and about Allah's words. You're saying that Allah's words have been corrupted. That is a very serious claim, my Muslim friend, and you need to know that. So they need to know, you're not attacking me, you're actually making statements against Allah, and that's a serious issue. Now, that may be a little too aggressive, and that's, I understand. So let's go with a more gentle approach. Um, rather than, and as you guys all say, rather than going immediately to defending arguments, and, and this is what I see is Christians oftentimes want to start by, well, let me give you all the facts and the details. Um, but I think the first and most non-threatening way is simply to ask questions, like you guys were saying. The first question, I think actually you brought this up. When was the Bible corrupted and by who? I think it's a very valuable, oh, you brought up. Um, I think it's a very valuable question. 
You're making this claim that the Bible has been corrupted. When was it done? And who would, who did it? Because we have this problem that Muslims would have. You have Muhammad living from the year 570 to 632. If a Muslim says, oh, the Bible was corrupted before the time of Muhammad. Sorry, you can't see the red X, but it's on the, your left before Muhammad. Well, we have passages from the Quran, uh, which we'll come back to in a bit, where, uh, for example, Surah 547 says, and let the people of the gospel, the Injil, judge by what Allah has revealed therein. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the defiantly disobedient. And Surah 10, and this is actually directed to Muhammad, Surah 1094, so if you are in doubt, O Muhammad, about that which we have revealed to you, then ask those who have been reading the scriptures before you. The truth has certainly come to you from your Lord, so never be among the doubters. And we'd be left with this question, if the Bible was corrupted before the time of Muhammad, then why is Allah telling Christians to judge by that book? And why is he telling Muhammad, if you have questions, go ask the people who have been reading that book? Why would Allah choose to have us judge by corrupted text? It doesn't make sense. It's almost setting us up for failure. Now, a Muslim might say, oh, no, no, it was good then, but it was bad afterwards. It got corrupted afterwards. So we have afterwards. The problem is that we have many, many texts from before the time of Muhammad that we can compare to. We have Hebrew, we have Greek, we have Syriac, we have Coptic, we have Samaritan Hebrew, we have Latin, Armenian, Georgian, Old Nubian, Yiz, and Gothic. The one thing we don't have is an Arabic translation because the first Arabic translation that we have is in the year 867, so about 150 years after the time of Muhammad. So you get the idea that there were all these translations but none of which the people could read if they were literate because they were, would be needing to read Arabic. So we got this problem because we have all these texts that we can go back and look at. So I actually have a Greek New Testament and I'll tell my Muslim friends, well, would you like to read the original manuscripts? Or I live in, in the Holy Land and I can take you and we can see the, the Isaiah scroll, which is in Old Hebrew. So, I can show you texts that predate the time of Muhammad and we can compare it to our modern Bibles. Even that could be a great question. Would you be interested in doing that? Because if my, and I'll even kind of give them something. I'll say, you know, if my text is corrupted, I want to know that. So are we willing to prove this? And of course, you go do the evidence, you'll find, no, our text is not corrupted. The second question you could ask, why would Allah not protect his other holy books? Were people more powerful than Allah. Muslims will often say, well, there was a gospel, the Injil in Arabic, and that was not corrupted. But then Paul came along, Dr. Paul, and he corrupted it. They seem to be mixing Luke as a doctor and Paul and putting, but he corrupted the real message of Jesus. And the real message of Jesus would have been Islam, that Jesus would be a Muslim and that the, the Bible was corrupted by the followers afterwards. We have a few problems with this. First of all, multiple times in the Quran itself, it declares that Allah's word cannot be corrupted. Now, Muslims will point and say, well, this is only about the Quran. But we'd have to ask the question, if Allah, one step back, Muslims believe there are five holy books. There was the book of Abraham, the book of Moses, the book of David, the book of Jesus called the Injil, and finally the Quran of Muhammad. These were all supposedly given to them. For Muslims, the book of Abraham has been lost. The book of Moses, David, and Jesus have all been corrupted, and only the Quran is still uncorrupted. And I would just, to be irreverent, Allah doesn't have a very good track record of protecting his books. So what makes me trust the claim that the Quran is still valid? If Allah could not protect his other holy books, why would I trust him to protect the Quran? And I'll actually sometimes, if I have an aggressive guy in this, I'll say, you know, congratulations, you've just made me also not believe the Quran. Because you're saying Allah could not protect his other holy books, I can't trust the Quran then. Once again, it's, it's they're using an argument 
but realizing they're making a statement about Allah. They're making a statement about his character, about his protect, ability to protect words. Um, then the next thing that we can look at is just ask the question, why would Allah instruct Christians and Jews to judge by corrupted books? And we looked at this before. There's two passages, these especially from the Quran. It's almost as if Allah would be setting the Christians and the Jews up for failure. If he's telling them, judge Muhammad based on your previous scriptures, but oh yeah, your previous scriptures are corrupted. It doesn't make sense for to tell somebody to judge by something that is corrupted. Also, the Quran itself never declares that the Bible has been corrupted. The Quran actually affirms scripture over and over again and declares that Muslims are to treat all the scriptures the same, that they're not to see one as greater than the other. Now, in practice, Muslims have said, we see the Quran as superior to all others. But according to the Quran, they're supposed to judge all of them equally. And this has given rise to uh, what an apologist named David Wood has argued, which he calls the Quranic Dilemma which is that we only have two options. The Bible is the word of God, or the Bible is not the word of God. That's it. Those are our only two options. If the Bible is false, and it is not the word of God, the Quran affirms the Bible. So then the Quran is wrong, and it is false, because the Quran is affirming something that's not right. If the Bible is the true word of God, as we Christians claim, the Quran fundamentally disagrees with the Bible, so thus the Quran would be wrong and thus false. And so either way, it doesn't come out very good for the Quran. Now, as I said, this, these are discussions I would have with a Muslim friend. But I think sometimes asking these questions and asking your Muslim friend to walk through it, just, I want you to explain this to me. And I'll even tell them, I want to follow God. I want to go where God leads. So if, if my book is corrupted, I would want to know that. Can you prove that to me? The problem is they can't. But I can prove my scriptures are valid. Um, and so I want to walk, rather than me trying to convince them with evidence and evidence of, of supporting scripture, because what will happen is that your, most of the time your Muslim friend will say, that's nice, but I don't, I don't believe that. So I need them to walk through the logic of what they're arguing. And also the implication, the conclusions. Because if you're making these claims, you're also making claims about Allah's character, his ability to protect his word. Now we have a, at the end of each section, I want to give you just a few reflection questions. These are ideas of questions that you could possibly ask a Muslim friend. Um, Torah, by the way, is the, the Islamic word for the Torah, and the Injil is the Arabic word or the Islamic word for the gospel. Um, first is, you know, when was the, these books corrupted and by who and how? Second, why in the Quran itself would Allah encourage Christians and Jews to judge by corrupted books? We talked about that. Another one, do you mean that Allah could not protect his previous books? Were people more powerful than Allah? And how can I trust Allah to protect the Quran? And finally, and this is a common one I would ask a Muslim friend, is just, have you read the Bible for yourself? You're making a claim about something. Have you actually read it? Um, and it can be an interesting way to invite a Muslim friend to come and study it with you. Now, the last one is, we didn't actually get to the second part of the argument, which is the Quran is perfectly preserved for 1,400 years. That would be a question I might ask a Muslim friend, can you prove that to me? Because I need, if that's a claim you're making, can you prove that? Um, can you prove to me that it's not been corrupted since the time of Muhammad? It hasn't been changed at all. Can you even show me a Quran written by Muhammad's own hand? Because that's one thing Muslims often say is, unless we have the, the Injil written by Jesus, we can't trust it. Well, I want to see the Quran written by Muhammad, which historically, there was no Quran written by Muhammad. Muhammad supposedly recited it, and then people wrote it down later. So they can't do the thing they're arguing that you Christians need to do. Um, and so that could be a thing, but I'd be happy to talk with you more about that. But I want to move us on to objection number two. Uh, I took a long time on this first one because the next two objections are predicated. They require at least some acceptance that, okay, maybe the Bible is true. 
because they're going to appeal to that. So this objection is usually going to be one of the first ones you're going to need to deal with with a Muslim friend. And don't worry, it will come up. So you don't have to worry about it. It will, it will happen very quickly. Um, objection number two, Jesus is not God. You Christians worship three gods. We Muslims, we respect Jesus, but we believe he is only a messenger sent by Allah. We Muslims, oops, sorry, there was a fly on this. Um, we Muslims only worship one God, which is Allah. Or you'll hear it in a different way, more of a direct, Jesus is not the son of God. If you pick up this, it can be phrased in different ways, but it's basically a rejection of the Trinity. Christians, you worship three gods, or you claim Jesus is God, Jesus is not God. It, if that makes sense, that's the main topic that is being addressed in these. So you'll hear this in, in different ways, but it seems to be a similar objection. So um, one thing I want to give you before we, we have you turn, so once again, you're going to turn to your neighbor in just a second to, to discuss this. How in one minute would you answer this? And I'll come back to this slide in just a second. But you should know that in Islam, there's something called al-shirk. And it is the association. This is the greatest sin you can commit in Islam. There's, there's horrible sins you can commit, but this is considered one of the worst. And it can basically be broken down into three parts. It is to worship any other thing as a deity or God instead of Allah, you can think of this as idolatry. It is to worship other deities and gods in addition to Allah, polytheism, or to worship anything as sharing in Allah's divine attributes or to associate others with him. Muslims would say, well, Christians, we don't think you do number one and two. Definitely number three you're guilty of. And that's their argument. They'll say, you're associating Jesus with Allah and that's, that's al-shirk. That is the association they're actually talking about. You are associating children, in this case, with Allah. Um, so, just to give you a little bit of background on this, most Muslims have been taught that the concept of the Trinity is just veiled polytheism. Um, that we, we as Christians took Jesus, who was a human messenger, and we made him into a god alongside Allah. Um, even in the, cons the Quran, the concept of the Trinity is, is painted in a very weird way, um, almost implying that there is Allah, there is God the Son, Jesus, and then there is God the Mother, Mary. Um, and I do want to say, just as a warning, before we dismiss this, um, we do need to look at it from a Muslim perspective, which is that for example, I, where I live, we have a lot of Catholic and Orthodox churches. And if you're not from a Catholic or Orthodox background, you could easily see all of these, these icons or statuaries as being somehow worshipful. And you might assume that you're worshiping multiple gods. So just to say Muslims may be coming from that perspective. Um, but with this all in mind, I want you to turn to your neighbor. I want you to take one minute each to ask the question, how would you answer this objection? What answers would you give? What questions would you ask? So go ahead and take one minute, one minute each. And I'd love to hear what you guys talked about because I think for many Christians, trying to explain the concept of the Trinity to another Christian can sometimes be challenging, much less trying to state it to a Muslim who is already accusing you of being a polytheist. Um, so, I'd love two or three people. What did you guys share? Yes. I don't listen to anything. You have to ask questions. Ask questions. All right. Ask questions about what you believe is a deep person of the Trinity. Okay. What you said there about Mary is obviously not what the biblical understanding of the Trinity. Um, so, I'd ask questions about the person of the Trinity and then about. about Jesus' divinity, what he's heard, what he's understood, uh, where he would think that comes from in the Bible. I'm guessing he would look at sort of the New Testament. Mm. And I would want to draw him to the Old Testament to show mm. that Trinity is present in the Old Testament. It doesn't appear, it's not a concept that appears when Jesus 
Well, when God gives you this epiphany, mm-hmm. uh, maybe, yeah. Okay. So asking a good question and maybe pointing him to where we find the concept of the Trinity. First of all, asking him to clarify what he or she means, like understanding what they think this means, and then taking them to even the Old Testament to show examples of it. Yeah, a firm monotheist. I think that's always a first good start. Sometimes when a Muslim says, well, you Christians worship three gods, I'll say, no, that is blasphemy. Anyone who says there's more than one God is committing blasphemy. And I only believe in one God. Just so that they know, I see myself as monotheist. So that's a good point. Yes? I was actually going to start the way that you mentioned it and say, I only believe in one God. I would be disobeying what the Bible says. to say, um, I worship God only in the way that Jesus commanded me to. Mm-hmm. Can we look at the Bible together and see okay. what did Jesus, how did Jesus command us to worship God and what did he say about the Bible? Okay, great. One more? Anyone? Yes. Um, I've asked them if they think God is knowable and personal. Okay. What they think God is like. Because... I find that not only do a lot of Muslims think that to have three is a problem, they also think that to have God as a human is a problem too. Mm-hmm. And this stems from a belief that you, you can't really know God, I think. Yeah. And this is a fundamental difference, that Christianity is a relationship with God, and that he can be known in many ways, but primarily through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. So kind of questioning about, do you believe that God is personal? Or even the idea that God would actually enter into creation. A lot of Muslims I've known who have said, no, Allah would never. Can you imagine Allah needing to use the bathroom or needing to sleep? How uh, stuff Allah, like Allah forbid it. He could not do that. And my question is, well, what if Allah chooses to do it? Allah can do what he wants. So I need to, I can't say he can't do something. I feel that. Um. So these are great. So taking them, like asking the good questions, but also saying, hey, I'm, I'm a strict monotheist and I'm, gonna, I'm trying to follow God as Jesus told me to. So um, these are great. And I want to take you just to the points that Muslims would usually argue. So first, uh, in Surah 4, uh, if you have never read the Quran, it is a somewhat confusing book. It's written poetically, and it's not written in topical order. It's actually written that the longest surah is kind of at the beginning. The shortest surah or chapter is at the end. Um, So it's kind of mixed up. But if you want to get a good idea, you can read surahs one through five, and that covers a lot of topics about Christians and Jews and relationship of holy books and stuff like that. So this is from surah four, uh, 171. O people of the book, that is Jews and Christians, do not go to extremes regarding your faith. Say nothing about Allah except the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, was no more than a messenger of Allah and the fulfillment of his word through Mary and a spirit created by a command from him. So believe in Allah and his messengers and do not say Trinity. Stop for your own good. Allah is only one God. Glory be to him. He is far above having a son. To him belongs everything, whatever is in heaven and whatever is on earth. Allah is sufficient and a trustee of affairs. In Surah 5, so the next Surah, they disbelieve, they disbelieve those who say Jesus or God is the Messiah, the son of Mary. But the Messiah himself said, O children of Israel, worship God, my Lord and your Lord. Whoever associates others with God, God has forbidden him paradise and his dwelling is in the fire. The wrongdoers have no saviors. They disbelieve those who say God is one a third of three, but there is no deity except the one God. And if they do not refrain from what they say, a painful torment will befall those among them who disbelieve. So you see, the, the Quran does not mince its words with a rebuke against. And so for many Muslims, this feels like one of the strongest things they can stand on is Jesus is not God. Jesus is not the son of God, which we'll get to in a second, because um, other portions of the, as we saw in, in Surah 4, um, Allah is only one God. Glory be to him. He is far above having a son. That's repeated multiple times in the Quran. Allah has no children. 
And human beings cannot call themselves the children of Allah. Um, so you've got these, these very strong critiques. Um, finally, we have Surah 112 at the very, very end. Um, by the way, if you ever visit the holy city of Jerusalem, this is actually what is written around the Dome of the Rock, uh, the, the silver, or excuse me, golden dome on the, the top of the Temple Mount. In the name of God, the gracious and the merciful, say, he is God, the one, God, the absolute. He begots not, nor is he begotten, and there is none comparable to him. The begot not, nor is he begotten, says, Allah was not given birth. He didn't come from something, but he also does not have children. He doesn't give birth to gods. So we've got all of this, and we struggle with it. The Quran seems very, very clear. So how would we address this? Well, I want to give you Kevin's answer. And this is actually an answer I use for a lot of Muslim objections. It is seven words. I'll give you a moment if you need to write them down. Jesus said it, so I believe it. That is the end. That is my answer in a lot of cases with Muslim friends. Because we can try to spend all our time coming up with uh, helpful illustrations of the Trinity. The Trinity is like water that can be ice and, and gas and, and liquid all at the same, I, at the same time. It's, it's like a flower. It's like, and a Muslim thinks, I was talking about God, and Kevin is now talking about water and flowers. The other thing is that a Muslim might think, I can do all the arguments I want, and a Muslim might think, Kevin seems like a very nice guy. He's a heretic, but he's still a nice guy. And they walk away dismissing everything that I have said. My goal over the years has shifted from me trying to come up with the best answers to shifting to the person of Jesus instead. Because I want my Muslim friend to have to wrestle with Jesus. Because if they walk away and they've only wrestled with what I've said, they'll think I'm a heretic and they'll go on with their life. But Jesus will stay with them. Jesus will keep wrestling with them. Jesus will keep drawing themselves. And so what I find, one of my goals, is that, that Muslims almost get tired of hearing me always say, Jesus said, or Jesus did, and then a direct quote from Jesus. And this is because I just want my Muslim friends to, to not dismiss it because Kevin the Christian said it. I want them to have to, to really listen to Jesus. And so I try, um, and I want to give you a side note. I get a lot of people ask, for those of you who are, who are just starting, maybe you're interested in reaching out to Muslims, people ask me, what book should I read? Should I listen to a lecture? Should I read the Quran? Yeah, those are all helpful. But the number one thing that you can do, read the Gospels over and over and over and over again. Get so rooted in telling Jesus stories and telling quotes from Jesus. In the end, my job is just to be a messenger. I'm just telling you what Jesus said about himself. Now, a Muslim might say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. He did a lot. These are all the references in the Gospels where Jesus either says something, does something that only God can do. Now, Muslims might be a little bit softer. They'll say, well, like, or excuse me, a little bit even more strict than this. They'll say, Jesus is not the son of God either. And I'll say, okay. But the problem is that the angel Gabriel or Jibreel, who according to Islamic tradition, gave Muhammad the Quran, declared Jesus to be the son of God when he is announcing to Mary. God declared Jesus to be the son of God. And Jesus declared himself to be the son of God. Jesus multiple times referred to God as father. And even down at the bottom, he said, are, you are blaspheming because I said, I am the son of God. I love this story this is from John 10, and this is the story where, where Jesus says, I and the Father are one, and they pick up stones to stone him. And, and Jesus says, why are you going to stone me? Uh, um, 
And they say, we're not stoning you. For, sorry, he asks them, um, for which of the good deeds are you going to stone me? And they say, it's not for the good deeds, but it's because you, a mere man, which is what the Islamic view of Jesus would be. He is a sent prophet, but he's still a mere man. Claim to be God. And Jesus' response is not, oh, heaven forbid, I would never claim something like that. There's only one God. You guys have, which is the Quranic view that, that Jesus would say, no, there's only one God. Worship only one. I am just merely a messenger. Jesus doesn't answer it that way. Instead, he continues on the story and talking about his relationship to the Father. And I would just want to ask a Muslim, what do you think Jesus means by all of this? To move us along, just a few reflection questions that we can do. As one, one of our friends said, um, starting with the question, what do you think Christians mean when they talk about Jesus as the Son of God and the Christian concept of the Trinity? And then, is their view accurate to what you really believe? Because if a Muslim were to say, well, I think Christians believe in God the Father, God the Mother, God the, the Son, I'd be like, that's not what I believe at all. Can I actually share with you what I really believe? Or there was another part where a, a Muslim friend said, well, you guys took a human messenger and you made him into God. I say, no, that's not what we believe at all. Can I share with you something we call the incarnation? Especially around Christmas, it's a great time to do it. Can I talk about how we don't believe Jesus was just a human being that got deified, but we believe he was God among us, coming down into our presence. And a Muslim may not say, what must I do to believe now? They may not instantly respond, but at least you're clarifying for them what you really believe and hopefully being able to have a discussion out of that. The second question, and this is actually, I think, a very valuable question to ask ourselves about many things. If Jesus declares that he is the son of God, would you believe him? I can imagine many Muslims telling Jesus, no, Jesus, you're wrong. You're not the son of God. And I'd say, well, if Jesus claims something about himself, I am going to believe him. I'll even tell my Muslim friends, I'll say, you are a human being. I am a human being. I am not a prophet. If Jesus says something, I listen to Jesus. Jesus says it, so I believe it. Or we can even, if we are able to get to that point, ask the question, Jesus, with almost kind of fact, Jesus declared himself to be the son of God and called God his father. What do you think Jesus meant by that? So it's not even bringing in the question of, is Jesus the son of God? Jesus claimed it. So what do you think, my Muslim friend, Jesus meant by that when he said that? And finally, a good question always asked, have you read the Bible for yourself? Jesus makes a lot of claims about himself in the Bible. Have you ever read them? Would you like to? Um, know this, just as a note, that the concept of Jesus being God, Jesus being the Son of God, is not a concept that is easy for Muslims to make sense of. Honestly, it's not even a concept that's easy for Christians to fully make sense of. Hence why we need to come up with cute analogies to try to explain it. But it's something that they will discover about Jesus as they go on. And so their initial rejection of it, but they'll read more of Jesus claiming this about himself. So don't assume that from a conversation you're going to switch their mind and say, oh, I, yes, I'm now open to the idea. No, it's more of, I know this idea is confusing. It's confusing to me as a Christian, but I want to be faithful to what Jesus said about himself. Whether I understand it or not does not matter. I know this defeats some of our natural apologetic approaches, but it's not, does Kevin have an answer to this? It's more, Jesus claimed this about himself, so that ends it. Whether I understand it or not doesn't matter. It's the authority of Jesus I'm standing on. All right, we'll go to uh, number three, and then we'll see how we do on time for the other ones. So, why do you believe Jesus died on the cross? Allah would not cause one of his prophets to die. Besides, and this is a direct quote from a Saudi friend of mine. Besides, God does not need a sacrifice to forgive sins. He is Allah, and he can just forgive them.
I want to give you just, this is the quote from the Quran that many Muslims will go to. It's a famous passage. You'll probably hear it if you have Muslim friends. It's from, once again, Surah 4. Uh, Surah 4 covers a lot of things about Christians and rejections of, of Christian beliefs. So uh, Surah 4, 156 to 159, they that's being mentioned in this is the Jewish people that they rejected faith and that they uttered against Mary a grave, a grave false charge and that they said in boast, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they killed him not, nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge, but only conjecture to follow. For of a surety they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him unto himself. Allah is exalted in power wise. And there is none of the people of the book, Jews and Christians, but must believe in him, Jesus, before his death. And on the day of judgment, he, Jesus, will be a witness against them. So Muslims will point at this passage and say, look, the Quran says Jesus did not die. For them, that ends it. And um, they'll point to this passage as proof. So I want to give you, once again, uh, a chance to turn to your neighbor. This may be our last discussion one. Um, turn to your neighbor, and I want you to take one minute each. How would you answer this, or what questions would you ask? So go ahead and turn to your neighbor, and we'll come back in two minutes. All right, so we're going to come back together. And once again, I'd love to hear two or three um, people. How would you answer this objection? What what would you answer? What would you ask in response? Yes, sir. Do you think a mother can recognize her own son? Do you think a mother can recognize her own son? Interesting. All right. Okay, so he's, he's making the argument that Mary would kind of know who was on the cross and would know it was her son. Okay. Other that that's a, I've never taken that approach. That's an interesting one. So yes, sir. I would uh, point out that Jesus said, "Nobody takes my life; I take my life." So go to a quote from Jesus, and about Jesus claiming this of himself. Yes, in the back. That's a great question. Once again, asking, so the Quran actually makes a claim, which is that Allah would protect the followers of Jesus until judgment day, and that they would be the, among the greatest. But a Muslim's claim would have to say, yeah, but, but these followers of Jesus got deluded and confused very, very early on, that they thought Jesus had died on a cross, he had been resurrected, but he wasn't. It would be very weird. So kind of saying, why would Allah kind of set this up for them to be confused. And this, going back even to this question of why would Allah choose, tell them to judge by corrupted books? It seems like you're saying Allah sets the Christians and the Jews up for failure, which is a very weird thing. So those are great. Um, and so we can, once again, look at turning this uh, in a discussion way. Um, so one of, one of the gentlemen brought up a really good point. Um, one of the ways that I can do this is to start with kind of a, a direct response, not a harsh response in this, but just to say, Jesus said that this was one of his purposes that he was sent by Allah for. And I would show them from Matthew 20, where Jesus says, now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the 12 aside and he said to them, we are going to Jerusalem and the son of man will be delivered over the chief priest and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and he will be handed over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. And on the third day, he will raise to life. And I would say to him, my Muslim friend, Jesus said it, so I believe it. So we can have a discussion on what you think Jesus means by this. But in the end, it doesn't matter what I as a Christian. It doesn't matter what Christian theologians have taught. It doesn't matter what Islam has taught, it matters to me what Jesus said about himself. So Jesus said it, so I believe it. The other one that I've used, uh, and I've, I find this, this catches off guard, I will respond with, the Quran is absolutely right. 
and a Muslim will be shocked a little bit. And I'll say, the Jewish people didn't kill Jesus, even if they think they did. Did you know that Jesus said that he, nobody could actually take his life, nobody could kill him, but that he was going to give it on his own? And I would take them to John 10. And I would say, Jesus said he was going to freely give his life. Like the above responses, doing this keeps the focus on the person of Jesus and what Jesus said about himself. That's what I always want to go back to. Not what Kevin thinks, not how well Kevin can explain it, but I want to go back to the person of Jesus and quotes from Jesus himself. Now, some reflection questions that you can have in this is simply to say, you know, if Jesus said he was going to die on the cross, did Jesus lie or was he wrong? Because your Muslim friend is going to have to say that if Jesus made that quote, Jesus either lied or he was wrong, which is a very dangerous thing in Islam to say about a prophet. I am not a prophet. You are not a prophet. You can't really be judging that a prophet lies. But you would have to be saying that because Jesus seems very clear to say that this is his purpose. And you, my Muslim friend, are saying it didn't happen. The next one, if Jesus said he needed to die on the cross, would you believe him? I think this is always a good question to push back to say, would you listen to Jesus if Jesus disagrees with you or with Islam? Who are you going to listen to? And if a Muslim says, well, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't believe it. Okay, then we have a completely different issue in this. Um, this is more, once again, one that I might use a little bit more antagonistically if I've got somebody who's just kind of arguing. I would ask, why do Muslims see Allah why do Muslims not see Allah as holy and righteous? Or why do they see him as less holy and righteous than Christians do? Because most Muslims think the exact opposite. They think we Muslims have a much higher view of Allah and his holiness than, than you Christians do. But I would say, well, but by your definition, sin is no big deal. We say that Allah, as as was mentioned yesterday in the, the talk here on hell, that Allah actually has to judge sin. And so we believe that is a big deal and that Allah is actually righteous by doing that. Can I tell you though, because Allah realized that that would mean judging us, can I tell you why he did what he did? And we can use a little bit of a, a springboard. Um, finally, I want to, to ask once again, have you read the Bible? For yourself. Jesus makes this and lots and lots of claims. Have you ever read it? With a Muslim friend, by the way, though, I would encourage you to start always in a gospel. They don't trust Paul. So taking them to Romans and taking them down the Roman road of salvation is going to mean nothing to them. They need to hear it from Jesus himself. That is the most important thing. Um, I do want to point out one thing that I've been mentioning in this talk. Um, and I'd be happy to have a conversation with people another time. I've used the term Allah and God interchangeably. Some of you may have noticed that. Um, with Muslims, um, I usually don't get into a debate on Allah and God um, because I, in the context in which I work in, and also in the Holy Land, we have many Arab Christians who use the word Allah as well as al -Hub. Um they, of course, mean something very different than the Allah represented in the Quran, but they still use that word. And with most Muslims, I have found that trying to have a argument with them on what is the appropriate name to use is not as helpful as having a discussion on how we see that person. And I'll actually tell Muslims this, Allah is Allah no matter what Christians, Jews, or Muslims believe about him. He is who he is. The question is, how has he revealed himself to us? That's So I want to say I, I'm, I'm using the term Allah with a Muslim to try to get to that point rather than trying to argue about, are you using the right word? Um, in different circumstances, it may be important to have that conversation. Um, but as I said, uh, within Arab Christian communities, at least in the Holy Land, they use Allah and al rub interchangeably. Um, but they would be very clear to say, but we don't believe in Allah as he's represented in the Quran. 
I just find that this is a secondary conversation with Muslims. But if I start with the thing of, I don't believe Allah, and you need to use the word God, for example, from English, uh, that can be problematic because I'm basically telling them, yeah, I need you to worship another God. And they'll, no, I'm not in. So just to say, I want to clarify that. Um, we're going to come to the end of this. And with the 20 minutes we have left, actually, I'm going to give you one quick fourth objection. Uh, the last two objections I have is, why don't you Christians follow Muhammad? I've gotten that one a few times. And that's a dangerous one because if you know, Muslims are very sensitive to any criticisms of Muhammad. So how do you answer that question? That's the one I'm going to do now. The last one, which would take a lot longer, is don't you Christians know that Muhammad is mentioned by name in your Bibles? And this comes usually from guys like Zahir Naik and Ahmed Didat and famous Muslim speakers. And they'll say, your Christian Bibles mention Muhammad by name. I have all those actually listed because if you ask a Muslim, can you show me where, they'll usually not know. They'll just, I've been told he's in there. I actually went through and looked at the verses and I also indicated why none of them actually mention Muhammad by name. Just a spoiler alert, sorry, but he's not in the Bible. Um, but I'm going to come back to this slide in a second, but let's just, I'm going to give you objection number four. And I'm going to give you how I used to answer it and how I answer it now. So objection number four is, we Muslims revere Jesus as a prophet. Why do you not accept Muhammad as a prophet? And I have gotten this from some Muslims. Usually this is actually a very genuine question. They're wondering, if you're so religious, why wouldn't you want to accept the final messenger? And it's not coming as an antagonistic. Usually it's, it's an honest question. And I want to treat it as such, or at least give the assumption it's an honest question. I used to try to have conversations. Like I would say, for example, well, if I followed Muhammad, I would be Muslim. And a Muslim would laugh about that. Because of course, you're Christian. You don't follow. But I want to know why. Well, that gets us into the dangerous waters of, but what can I say about Muhammad that's not going to be offensive and make you think I'm insulting him? So I would try to say things like, well, I appreciate Muhammad for what he means to Muslims. And I also really appreciate how much he talked about Jesus because I love Jesus and I would love to talk about Jesus. So I try to divert the question. Over time though, I think my approach has changed. And so I want to give you how I would usually ask this or answer this now. If somebody said, why don't you follow Muhammad? I would tell a Muslim friend, Jesus has given me eternal life. Jesus has allowed me to know the love of Allah. He's allowed me to have a relationship directly with Allah. He has given me eternal life, not only after I die, but even here and now. He's given me hope inside my heart and that I can have the spirit of Allah, the Holy Spirit, in my, my heart. How could I even think of following anyone else? I would, just, I, I would just leave with, I want to tell you why I love Jesus so much. I don't even care about Muhammad. I'm sorry, I wouldn't say it that way, but I would say, you know, how could I even think of following somebody else? Nobody else can give me the things that Jesus has given me. No one else can show me the love that Jesus has shown me. In my heart, it doesn't matter if it's Muhammad, Buddha, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, any other religious figure. How could I dream of following somebody else when Jesus has been so good to me? And that's the, the approach that I would uh, now take is, instead of answering your question, why don't I follow Muhammad, can I tell you why I follow Jesus? Why Jesus is such good news to me. Now, um, with, we're going to have about 15 minutes at the end, and I would love to ask have question and answers for anybody, or if there's other objections you've had, I tried to hit the main ones. Um, I'm also happy to meet for dinner. So if anyone wants to talk about things, um, dinner I think is coming up in a bit. Um, I'd be happy to have dinner with you and we can sit down and chat. Um, also, if you would like to sign up for the network, please feel free to do that here. You can also send me emails, any way that I can be of help or to connect you 
with somebody who can help you. Please feel free. Um, but I want to come back to what I said at the very, very beginning, the, my conclusion that I started with. We treated these objections as what to do if a Muslim brings up this objection. But the most powerful way you're going to declare the, the good news of Jesus is not being able to answer an objection. It's showing the love of God to your Muslim friend and showing yourself transformed by the love of God. I remember actually I was in, in Cairo a, a few years ago um, visiting an American friend and he said, I've got this, this Muslim friend that's asking me so many questions about, uh, about faith and about Jesus. Kevin, can you come and we'll have coffee together, the three of us, and you can, you can talk to him. I was like, cool, all right, sure. And the, the guy was very, very nice. Um, and he walked in. So my, my American friend and I are sitting there and, and the guy walks into the cafe. And uh, I just were introduced. Oh, this is my friend, Kevin. And, oh, the, and then I asked the guy, oh, so tell me about yourself. And he, he started talking to me about how he had just gotten a new job and that while well, his wife was, was doing really well, but their, their baby child had been sick, but now he's getting better. And the guy had just actually quit smoking. He went on for a very long time telling us about these things. In the moment, I realized actually answering his objections, not going to be the most important thing. And so before we only had like an hour and he took probably about half an hour telling us all of these things. And I said, you know, is it okay if we just pray right here to give thanks to God for all of these things? That's, that is great news. And so we just prayed. My American friend, I think the Muslim guy was kind of like, okay, sure. Yeah, you can. But we just gave thanks to God. Like, God, thank you for this, uh, this man. I'll keep his name out, but thank you for his child. And thank you that it's gotten better. And thank you for him giving up smoking and that you created our bodies and we want to take care of it. And we just gave thanks to God for what he had done in this guy's life. And in the moment, I felt that communicated more about God and about God's character than anything I could have said. Because it showed him that I believe that God loves this guy that God actually cares about this guy. And that I'm a stranger, but I also care about you as well. And so to close us out, I just wanna come back to this, which is in the end, love your Muslim friend, even when they're arguing with you. Sometimes I'm a little harsh, uh, Middle Eastern culture, we can have really, really heated debates about things and then be best friends immediately afterwards. Um, Share with your Muslim friends what God has done in your life. So talk about the ways that you have prayed about something. Talk, just let your love of God just pour out and, and talking about the way that God has cared for you. And also even how God has met you in struggles or when you're not doing well, how you're having trust in God. And let your personal love for God and his love for you show through. Because a Muslim can disagree with you on all sorts of theological issues, but they can't disagree with that. In some ways, your life, being an authentic follower of Jesus, is the greatest answer to Muslim objections. So with that, I'm going to finish, and we'll open up just to a time of question and answer. How to, to handle circular reasoning. Um, because you might say, for example, well, the Bible says, and the Muslim will say, well, the Bible is corrupted. Um, I think, once again, just keep pushing in with clarifying questions. And, that, and, and don't, I guess the first thing is, resist the urge to give an answer. Resist the urge to tell them what the correct answer is and make them kind of work through it. Because as they work through it, they'll discover that the, the objection they have isn't actually consistent. Or the objection they have has a much, much deeper um, consequence than they may think. They may think they're just rejecting your religion, but they're actually making statements. They need to know that. And I think I would do that is just keep asking questions. And if it feels kind of circular reason, ask the question again. Like, just let it. The other side, though, is know that in the end, you sometimes just need to stand on what Jesus has said. 
Don't worry if you can't answer something. Don't worry if your, your Muslim friend walks away and says, I, yeah, I don't think you know what you're talking about. M my goal, as I've said, is if I can get them to hear something Jesus said, that's going to stay with them. That's going to be, they'll have to keep coming back to, what did Jesus mean? They can think I'm an idiot. They can think I'm a heretic. I don't care. I want them to wrestle with Jesus. And so that would be kind of, I would ask questions and sometimes just be willing to, to stop and say, well, you know, I think we're going to disagree on this, but in the end, I'm going to listen to Jesus. So, yes, Alan. Thank you very much for your talk. Oh, no worries. Um, but uh, one argument I, I was missing, because I made very good experiences with the argument, do you believe that the Quran is eternal, or do you think the Quran was created? And most Muslims would say, of course, the Quran is the eternal book. Mm -hmm. Then I would ask, um, so what do you think is Allah's eternal and the Quran is eternal? What's the relationship? Then I would say, actually, you believe something that I also believe, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and this Yep. And a lot of Muslims would say, wow, where is that? Yeah. No, no, actually I was going to go down that route, but I realized it would take a little bit longer. But the the argument of saying, well, Muslims are not purely monotheist in the same way, because if a Muslim thinks the Quran is eternal and Allah is eternal. They've got two eternal things. That's a slight problem if you believe there's only one. And you could say, well, we Christians believe that exact same thing. Uh, we just believe that Jesus was a walking, talking word of God. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've used that sometimes as a, a counterpoint to talk with a Muslim friend and, and just kind of pushing back on an idea that maybe they have. Um, it really depends, though. They have to have really thought through it. So it, it depends each person. I was going to go down that route when we were talking about Jesus is not God, but I realized it might take a little bit longer. But thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a great kind of, but I feel like that would be kind of apologetics 2.0, um, where you're kind of having to know a lot more about Islamic beliefs. What I wanted to do was just approach us with asking some basic questions. Now, I did put up Quran passages there. You don't have to have those memorized, but I just wanted to say you could, but you could just even ask questions about things.